Hi, Ben here, and welcome back to the workshop for another Work in Progress Wednesday. So, kind of an exciting day for me as a knife maker. We've got some blades made, and obviously they're ready for handle scales now. And this is almost the, the best bit about being a knife maker. I can come to my sort of favorite cupboard in the workshop where I've got all my different handle materials. I mostly keep all my burlaps and my stabilized timbers in here. So we've got stabilized blocks of Massa birch, We've got some double dyed burls, maple burls, things like that. We've got some really nice figured maple burl that's been stabilized out in the States. I've also got some really nice native timbers that I actually stabilize in house as well. So these are some blocks of English elm that I've dried and then stabilized here in the workshop. Now, elm itself makes a fantastic durable handle material anyway. It's very dense, it's very tough, it's very split resistant but as soon as we stabilize it, it makes an even harder wearing handle. So elm is probably one of my sort of favorite handle materials because it's obviously a native British timber. It gives you a really nice mid-brown tone to the handle itself, which seems to sort of complement most outdoor gear. So we're gonna use this piece of elm to put on this knife. So obviously I leave it in this block form at this stage. So we've got to try and make it into handle scales. So we'll take it through to the next, uh, the next room where we've got the bandsaw and we'll show you how we actually prepare this ready for a knife. So we've brought the block of elm through to my bandsaw. I've had this for quite a few years and I like this one because it's got a very sort of clear measurement scale on the resaw table. So I tend to leave all my blocks in that block form so that they obviously stay nice and flat until I need them and I can choose whatever thickness I need for particular knives. For a woodlander I tend to cut this so that they're, I used to cut them in half and then you'd have a lot of wood to re-sand. Um, but I tend to cut this into 3 8 to sort of 7 16 thick slabs. So I actually use this little resaw table and I slide it along until I get the right measurement and then lock that in place. The blade that I'm using, I'm using, uh, and it's only a quarter inch wide, um, but it's a bimetal blade, so I use this for cutting wood, stabilized woods and micarta. If you use a standard carbon steel blade, they tend to dull quite quickly, so a bimetal blade is a bit more expensive, but it does seem to last. Um, then you want to make sure that you've got at least one flat side that will sit nicely up against your resaw fence here and obviously make sure you've got some push sticks as well. So I've got my push sticks, put my goggles on. Now turn the extractor on, it'll be a little bit noisy but hopefully you'll see what I'm doing. Using those push sticks, hold that up against the fence and then push that through. slab taken off, so I put that on one side. Obviously this is still thick, so I'm going to take a little sliver off that side as well. So we've now sawn our two scales. Now at this point, it's really important that I want to make sure that I keep the grain orientation as if it was still in that solid block form. So I've split my first scale off, I've got my second scale, and obviously that's a little bit of waste. Now if you've got a really thick block, sometimes it's worth keeping that piece, and then you can make a matching fire steel from it. That's a little bit too thin on that one. But now, so that I don't lose track of that grain direction, sometimes it's easy because you can read the grain on the end of the block, but for me, I like to hold those two slabs together again and with my pen, just put some marks so that when you line it back up, you know that those two sides line up like that. It seems sort of pernickety to do this, but I really like the fact that when you've actually finished the knife, if you've got some really nice grain on the handle slabs, they actually sort of flow through the knife and then into the other side. It almost looks like the handle's grown there. So yeah, important to mark those. Now at that stage, some people would think, well, that's reasonably flat, that will work. But to be honest, 
those saw marks will leave really ugly marks when you glue it to the knife so now it's important that we make that absolutely super dead flat and uh, yeah I'll show you the way that I go about doing that so we come through into the grinding room where I've got various bits of kit and this is a sort of homemade uh, disc sand that I've made. So I bought one of these made discs from Beaumont Metalworks and then mounted it to a three phase motor which I've got running through my inverter drive. And I've mounted it to the wall so that it's the plates facing up. Now I find that that's much easier for when it comes to using for actually flattening handle slabs because you can actually use your sort of body weight to hold it dead flat rather than holding it vertically onto a disc that's spinning that way just personal preference really. Now I've got a sort of not super duper fresh, I've used this quite a bit, this is a 60 grit zirconium disc which seems to work perfectly. I found if you use an absolutely super duper fresh disc it's almost too aggressive and you'll take too much off the corners so sort of use them for a bit grinding other materials before you actually use them for flattening your handle scales. Just while you're here, out of interest, this is actually a, a block that I've stabilised. You can see that I haven't cleaned this up yet, so you can see some of that resin that's oozed out as we've actually baked it. That makes the piece of wood super duper hard, so yeah, the fact that that was sat by the grinder, I thought you'd like to see it. Obviously with clean up, you wouldn't know that it's been stabilised, apart from the fact that it's a lot, lot denser. So, we've got our two halves, we've got them marked, and now it's important that we get rid of all those saw marks. Now when you're running the disc sander, another little tip that I'll give you is that if you run it too fast, you'll find that it will scrub the corners off. So if you're running it through an inverter drive and you've got it set so that it's showing you how many hertz that you're running at, I run it at about 20 hertz. So I'll turn it on and you'll roughly see what sort of speed it's running at. Fairly quick, but not like super warp speed. And at that stage, what I'll do, the sort of dust from previous scales, I'll clean that off by using one of these abrasive cleaners. This is just almost like the same rubber that's on your, your shoes, your crepe shoes, and that works really good. I've got my extractor set up again, so that's gonna suck the dust, so I'll turn that on. And you'll see that as I clean the dust out, that all goes down the dust extractor, but it cleans that surface of the sandpaper. Now, technique. Don't be laying the slab on at an angle, because you're just gonna grind the corner off. It's really important that you try and hold that scale so that you've got equal pressure, both sides, and I lay it on dead flat, and I actually move it around. You're sort of almost moving it in a figure of eight, really, I suppose. And after a few passes, have a look. So you can see that the sander's hitting here and here, but we've still got some of those ugly saw marks. If you're really sort of unfamiliar with using it and it's your first time making knives, you can even put a little bit of pencil on there and that will help you see where the low spots are basically. So, even pressure, just like so. And what I find, you see it's almost taking the pencil off straight away, just a little residue of that saw mark again. But after a while, I'll flip it round so I'm doing the other, other way. Obviously the disc's spinning in one direction so try and compensate for any extra pressure on one side to the other. Tiny little bit left there. And the important thing is when I finish grinding, I lift it off straight up. I don't want to be lifting it at an angle because if you knock those corners off, that's when you're going to end up with really ugly mark, um, ugly glue lines in your in your knife. So that's looking pretty damn flat now. We'll just compare it to the other one. So you can see it's not matching yet because we've got to do the, exactly the same process on this side. So yeah, we'll leave that one there. We might need a little bit of tweaking, but we'll we'll do that inside face. Okay, right, we have flattened both inside faces of this. I've also just knocked a little bit off the outside edges as well just to make sure that they're flat. And the important thing now is that we line it back up using those lines, our indicator lines. And I want to squeeze both ends and I want to make sure that it's good and flat. Now, if you've done it nicely, it almost looks like a solid piece of wood again. So you can't see any gaps, you can't see any sort of where the corners have been drifted off. So that's looking pretty much perfect. Now obviously if you haven't got 
a disc sander like this and you're making only a few knives it's probably not worth investing in one of these so next thing you can do best next best thing to a disc sander is just still buy some sanding discs from your abrasive supplier stick them either to a, a marble cutting board that you can buy from the supermarket or a piece of glass and then you'll just have to literally just do it by hand like so same scenario figure of eights you'll find work well and the bigger the disc the better because as you come to the edge of your disc that's where you have a tendency to round those corners so it is possible to totally do it by hand but obviously when you're making the amount of knives that we make then that basically saves you a little bit of elbow grease now at that stage if you were doing a knife that's linerless so it's basically just natural handle sc scales stuck to the either side of the knife then that would pretty much be ready to rock so that would go in like so now a lot of people like to add decorative liners for either the look but they also add a little bit of a sort of gasket layer there that helps it make a slightly better waterproof seal so i think we're going to stick liners on these uh, scales for this knife so uh, i'll show you how i go about doing that so i've come through to the bench that i've got set up for my glue up of my liners so i've mounted a piece of angle iron to the bench so i've got something that's dead flat and I actually use this uh, sort of non-stick, it's basically baking, uh, it's, it's, it's designed for baking, it's a non-stick sort of long-lasting baking sheet. Some people use wax paper but I find that this lasts a little bit longer and that stops the glue, basically stops you gluing your liners to your bench. Um, the liners themselves that I use, I use a combination of both uh, vulcanized fibre and also G10. So G10 liners are really good if you're making a knife that's going to be made from stainless steel, used a lot for food prep. It's going to be in sort of hot soapy water being cleaned and things like that because it's incredibly durable. You also get a real wide range of colours in the G10 and also thicknesses. Disadvantage of the G10 is when you actually glued it onto your handle scales, you can't just use your regular bandsaw because it will blunten the blade. So it does make the actual preparation of the handle a little bit more difficult. Um, the more sort of traditional uh, liner material that's been used for a long time is what we call vulcanized fiber. This comes in a more sort of limited range of thicknesses and colors, but I do like it in the fact that it's a little bit more natural if you're using natural handle materials it's a little bit more giving and people say well it's basically made from paper that's compressed with heat and glue to create this this material and you think wow paper's not very durable but if you were going into a your motor equip shop and getting a gasket for your car it would be base, basically made from exactly the same material so it's it's a it's a gasket material so that's what we're using it for not only will it add a nice colored accent in the knife it will create a nice little waterproof seal as well so we've got our two scales that we've flattened I'm going to choose black vulcanized fiber. Black tends to look really nice with elm. So a bit of preparation beforehand. I get a clean piece of tissue and then I've got some acetone in a little soap dispenser, an old soap dispenser. And I want to make sure that this is nice and clean. There's no oil, no grease, not even grease from my fingers on there. So clean that surface. And the acetone obviously will take any oil off, but it will also um, evaporate pretty quickly. And then I also want to clean the inside face of my handle material as well. And I do this whether it's natural material, whether it's Mercator, whatever. You always want to make sure that you give it a clean down with some acetone. Now, just let that evaporate. Now, we'll get this set up. Now, I used to use epoxy to glue the liners to the, the handle material. I found that sometimes it would almost be too hard a bond. So I actually use industrial grade super glue now. I find that it works really well. It means that you get a thinner bond and to be honest, if you get it wrong, you, you can't get the damn things off. So super glue works really well. So what I do is I just squirt a little bit of super glue onto the inside face of one handle scale. This is where it gets a little bit messy and then we make sure that we've got the correct inside see why those lines are so important when it comes to knife making and then i actually use the one scale to spread the glue onto the other half of the scale making sure that you've got glue over the whole surface you've not missed any just like so and then what we're going to do is we're going to then apply that to one of our liners 
same scenario I sort of waggle that scale around making sure that I've coated the whole of the liner with glue move that clamp out of the way and the same scenario on this one and you see now why that that sort of non-stick parchment paper or baking liner is so important because you're going to get glue squirting out that's basically what you want you want to make sure that there's enough glue that it squirts out the sides but obviously you want to be able to remove this from your bench when it comes to actually making the knife and then I use clamps you don't want to use excessive force because you obviously don't want to squeeze all the glue out from underneath the scale but I find that these little spring clamps just apply just the right amount of pressure that they don't squeeze all the glue out. Now you could be patient and just let that sit, but obviously because you're using super glue, you can actually use an activator. With the CA glue, you can use this sort of spray activator, which means that it will cure slightly quicker. And I actually think that it, it gives a better bond. So just squirt a little bit of that on there. Now, if you're working in the workshop and you've got tins of WD-40 and activator on the same bench, don't do what I do, which is sometimes pick up the wrong can. So keep your activator and your WD-40 separate. So we'll leave those. I normally glue them up the day before I need to actually use them. So they've got plenty of time to cure. But to be honest, the glue goes off in at least maybe five minutes. But it's nice just to let them sit there for a while. So we'll let them sit for an hour or so. So like I say, we'll let that fully cure. But we've got some previous slabs that I prepared. So these are Elm again with some black fiber liners. And you can see that we've just got a little bit of that glue bled through. But obviously having that non-stick mat means that we could peel them off. And then I'll just carefully clean off that little bit of extra glue. But they're basically ready to go on a knife. So we've got our liners fitted and our scales nice and flat. So what we'll do is we'll show you how we actually go about mounting these handle scales to a blade in a future video. But hopefully you've enjoyed seeing what we've been working on this Wednesday. And hopefully for the knife makers out there, it's given you a few top tips on how to prepare your handle scales so that they really nice, stay nice and flat and you get a really good glue bond on there. But yeah, hope you've enjoyed the video. And if you want to see what we're doing, then tune in next week and see what we're up to in the workshop. Thanks again.